and hear the word of the Lord today. Amen. All right, let's get going. So I was in this, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to school and, and pray for me. Every time you think about your pastor, just pray. But I, I, I'm, I'm back in school and, and I have this imaginary friend that I keep talking about. My imaginary friend is this person who I have to keep writing these papers and I'm trying to get this person saved. But I can't use the Bible. And so this last conversation that me and my friend were having was the fact that she had come to know, she had come to be open to receiving Jesus. However, she had a problem believing in miracles and the resurrection. And so my job was to convince her of miracles and the resurrection without using the Bible. And so I wrote this paper and I love Kelly. Kelly is a lifesaver. And I sent it to her, and her comment to me back was, you're using a whole lot of Bible to try to convince somebody that don't believe in it. And I think when we think of miracles, we automatically go back to the Bible, but what about the miracle that happens in your life? And I begin to think about some things, and after I cried probably for about an hour, I begin to rewrite this paper. And I had to convince her that, yes, the miracles in the Bible are true, but let me tell you a few in my own life that I can show you why God is real. We want to throw the Bible at a lot of people. I charge you to win souls without using it. (laughs) How do we do that in our lifestyle? And I begin to look over my life as the miracles started to happen. And I had so many, I went over the word limit, so I had to cut some. But I understand in my everyday life, there is a miracle. My, my youngest son is a miracle. They said he wasn't going to live. He coded a few times. He was in intensive care. He had more tubes than baby. And he's on the football field being a punisher on that line. Yes, your pastor yells, kill him! I try not to all the time, but if you even watching online, you hear me. Now, my husband bought me a bell now, so I just ring the bell. I can't ring it no more. But he's a miracle. But it's not even so much the way that he came through life and he was a warrior and he fought from the time he was born until he was about five years old. The amazing thing about Joshua is Joshua is a peacemaker. Can you believe as big as he is on the line, he gonna hit you and help you up. He genuinely cares for your well-being. Even in everyday life, at home and everything else, he is going to take the low road just so there can be peace. He'll argue with his brother because he can be a jerk. They my kids, I can talk about my kids. Don't leave the church because I'm talking about my kids. I'm not talking about your kids. But he can be at times. And and Joshua will just be like, you know what? Whatever. And he has something I don't have because I be sitting in the back like, just get him one good time. (laughs) Nobody thought like that. Nobody, anybody get tired of taking the high road all the time? Y'all ain't going to be honest with me. But he's just so, whatever it is, what he'll just take a low road. If his brother's going somewhere and he know his brother really don't want him to go and he know mama gonna make him take him anyway, he'll go, you know what, I won't go. Because he has developed in his warrior statue his own relationship with God and it starts with making peace. We're on this series of Lifestyle of the Kingdom And we've been talking about this thing called kingdom and not only what it is, which we understand that the kingdom is God's reign through God's people over God's place. And and so we get that. We are now new citizens. We come from the old kingdom and now we are part of his kingdom and God's kingdom. But in any kingdom, you got to know how to act. That's what rules and stuff is for is to teach people how to act. Well, there are not rules, but there's just a standard of living in the kingdom. And so we've been in Matthew, and Pastor Angela did a wonderful job last week about a pure heart. How many people needed that word? Like, you went home and was like, yeah, my heart ain't right. I'm telling you, I start off on Monday, 
and I check my heart all the way till I get here on Sunday morning. And I make sure that whatever's gotten in through the week that it doesn't bleed through on Sunday morning. Because it will seep in. We are in a contaminated environment, so therefore things that bother the heart will get in without you even knowing it. That's why you have to keep checking it. And so today, we, 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 we've, been, we've been dealing with the Beatitudes. And what are the Beatitudes? It means blessedness or happiness. We said, how many people want to be happy? Who want to be happy? Let me see. Happy, happy. I just want to be happy. But we understand what true happiness is. It is the ultimate hope and joy experienced in Jesus Christ despite our outward circumstances. That's the most important part about this blessedness that Jesus is telling us how we should act in the kingdom. It is despite what is going on in our outward circumstances because right now, if you look at what's going on out there, it's scary. I don't care what side you're on. I don't care what's happening. There is trouble and unrest in the world. Y'all don't live in this world. There are things that are scary out there. If you look through your natural lives, you'll never leave a house and you will, just be a, you, you will just be stuck indoors. You will never turn the TV on. You will be a hermit. You will just be with you. And isolation is of the devil. Man is not meant to be alone. So it's a lot happening, but he said, I'm going to teach you how to be happy in trying times when outward circumstances are just out of control. And so today we're going to pick it up in Matthew 5, 9. He says this, blessed or happiness, blessedness are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. How will people be able to be saved without us using the Bible? We have to have attributes of our Father. Do you know you are the only Bible that some people may ever read? There's a saying that says, preach the word and when necessary, use words. Your life your attitude, who you are should preach way louder than your tone and your words and your Facebook or Instagram post. You can't be po quoting scriptures on Facebook and living like hell and everybody see it. It just doesn't work. It don't add up. You don't look like your daddy. Whose child is this? DNA, please. Maury, who's the father? Blessed are the peacemakers. Pastor, where are you going with this? You know where I'm going. We're going into election. I'm going to get you ready. Who is the peacemaker? It's a peacemaker is a man. When I say man, it doesn't mean male. It means mankind, both male and female, which is the way God created it in the beginning. A peacemaker is a man who brings peace to another. But one cannot give another what one does not possess oneself. Hence, the Lord wants you first to be yourself filled with the blessings of peace and then to communicate it to those who have need of it. Sometimes we can't be the peacemakers because we don't have peace. How do I know you don't have peace? Because of the way you live. I'm going to step back just a little bit. Peace is not just an absence of conflict. It is not merely a cessation of hostility. Peace comes from the Greek word Irene, which means quietness and rest. Do you have a quietness and rest about you? And I'm not talking about you an introvert or extrovert. I'm saying, do you walk in an area of quietness and you're restful, that you are not moved or bothered by what is going on in the world? Which in turns is a rendering of the Hebrew, which is shalom. Shalom, which basically means, I desire for you all the righteousness and good God can give. I want to walk in such peace that I can bless somebody else with shalom. And when I say shalom, I'm being the peacemaker, which I'm pronouncing over you. I want you to have the righteousness and the good that 
only God can give. You can't have fake peace. You can try to fake other people. But peace has a way of showing up when it's absent. <laughs> Every time you look at the coronavirus numbers, some of you, you lose your peace. Peace go out the window. Peace was made of steel. Peace be still. It is a term that can be meant to say peace or completeness and welfare. But how do I get this peace, Pastor? Philippians 4, 8 through 9, it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, now that right there, I can stop and preach a whole message just on what is true. Most of the things that are being said and shared on social media are false. And here you are believing a lie and spreading that lie. You will never be a peacemaker and you will never have peace. Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me or in Paul or in the one who is speaking, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. How do I find peace? I got to find what's true and honorable and just and lovely. And can I tell you, this is an everyday thing, sometimes an every moment thing, every 20 minutes. Because there's so much negativity trying to come at you to take your peace. And I told you before, your peace is too expensive to let somebody else have. You can have a whole lot of things. I give you my clothes. I give you furniture, I give you a lot of things, but you can't have my peace. My peace is, uh, is non-negotiable. You'll take my shoes, ain't they cute? My peace is, is non-negotiable. You can't have it. I protect it with my life. You're not worth my peace. And when I find the enemy tries to trouble me like he has all week because I was preaching this message, I've had such a battle trying to have things and try to take my peace. I have to find what is good and what is lovely and what is of a good report and what is, of, uh, what is faithful, what is excellent, what is commendable. My mind, uh-uh, no, mm -mm, God, you're still God. You're still good. If I can't find that in my own life, I can always point to him. God, I remember when. And before you know it, that anxiety and whatever is trying to come in, it will flee if you keep your mind on these things. He will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. Where's your mind at? Psalms 34, 14 says, seek peace and pursue it. A peacemaker is one who is prepared to pursue peace and pay the high price if necessary. What is the high price of peace? You may have to just be wrong, even though you're right. It is more important for me to have peace than it is for me to be right. What does that mean? I may not agree with your stance. I may not agree with your opinion, but I am not going to lose my peace over it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to speak shalom on you. You have to pursue peace. You can't just sit around and let peace happen because it's not just going to happen. The enemy knows that if you continue to concentrate, whatever you put your mind on, he can't fill you with the fear and with the anxiety and with all these other things and, and all the church has gone crazy with these conspiracy theories and all this other stuff. You won't be in, you, you, know, you know what? It ain't worth my peace. I have turned things off. I, I would be listening to the news and they would only report one part of it and they got you all scared. You know what? No, change that. Why? It's not worth my peace. Because the truth of the matter is there's nothing you could do about it anyway. So I'm not going to spend my time and my energy worrying about something that I don't have the power to change. 
but I do know a God that is able to change and do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Ain't nobody got time for that. Yes, I did say ain't nobody. <laughs> See, you have to have that holy boldness build up. You're like, you know what? No, I'm not doing this. People just pushing your buttons anytime they feel like it and sending you an uproar. I'm not participating anymore. My peace is too valuable. Because then if I don't have peace, I can't speak peace on everybody else. And how many know there's a whole lot of people that need some peace right about now? So when he knocks you out of your peace, you done knocked about four or five other people out of theirs. He called you to be the peacemaker. If I can't speak peace, then I'm one less person. Just like the virus, one person infects many other people. Peace is the same way. But if he knocks you out of your peace, who's speaking peace to the four or five people you were supposed to speak peace to? And if they grab a hold of peace, they can speak peace to four or five people. I don't care what they say about civil unrest. If the peacemakers stand up, it won't be no unrest. I'm, I'm, I'm not yelling at you. I'm getting a little excited. I'm going to try to calm down. But my peace is on the line. Your peace is what he's after. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Jesus didn't leave us a formula for making peace. Peacemaking comes more easily for the poor in spirit. Remember we preached that two weeks ago. You got to be humble. Who can see the beauty of reconciliation then for the proud hearted who only see the need to avenge their hurts. Can I tell you, everything that we have taught in this year, we need it right now. We need to seek reconciliation like never before. Why? Because the enemy wants you to take your peace. He wants you to join the bandwagon and, and, and further the division. I'm talking about in the church. The body can't stand if the body is not united. One of Jesus' main prayers, he said, Man, God, I just want them to be one. I don't know about you, but it seems a little harder to be one these days. You mad at somebody else because they represent somebody else that did something to you. And I know there's some terrible things that's happened. But nothing compares to what happened on that cross. They beat him unrecognizable. Flesh fell from his bones. So although we have our hurts, let's not wear them as banners. Let's get them healed. And let's keep moving in the things of him because he's already nailed all of it to the cross. When Jesus greeted others with shalom, he meant total well-being. When somebody is irate, I dare you just tell them, you know what, shalom. They can't argue with themselves. I know, my husband used to do it to me all the time. I would be going off and going off and yelling and acting a fool, and he would just pray. And then I get an attitude like, so you gonna tell Jesus on me? <laughs> but eventually, guess what happened? Shalom. Total well-being, because obviously there's something broken in you. It's not just health of body, but health of mind and heart. All who seek healing as a way of life are dispensers of shalom. I carry shalom with me. I hardly am ever in a, in a situation where it gets out of hand. Even at football games, even at grocery stores, I just have a way to be able to calm whatever's happening. Why? Because I'm a dispenser of shalom. You are called to be a dispenser of shalom, but you can't give out something that you don't have. Charles Spurgeon says this, and I'm done. Blessed are the peacemakers, and one sure way of peacemaking is to let the fire of contention alone. Neither fan it, nor stir it, 
nor add fuel to it, but let it go out by itself. Do you understand contention cannot burn if you don't add any fuel to it? You know people ask questions and you know that they're contentious. You know they really don't want an answer. Why even entertain that? When people are deliberately ignorant, you let them be. And you know what you tell them? Shalom. I don't have time to fight with anybody over who is going to be the next president of the United States. Why? Because it really doesn't matter in my kingdom. Issues are there, right side, wrong side. But if you truly believe that the king is on the throne, you can have your opinion and I want you to vote and all that. But it does not determine your destiny because you are not of this world. I'm out here now. If you're going to crucify me, go on, crucify me. They crucified Jesus. We shouldn't be that caught up. You want my endorsement? I'm going to give it to you. Jesus. That's my endorsement. You pray and ask God on which way you're supposed to go, and you do that. You be obedient to that. But you don't have to be contentious with your neighbor over it. Because then you lose your peace. And if you're called to dispense peace in the earth, that is why there is a lack of peace in the earth. Now, don't let the fire of contention, leave it alone. Don't fan it, don't stir it, don't add fuel to it. Let it go out by itself because it will. Begin your ministry with one blind eye and one deaf ear. I love this. I look, I'm not even focused on that. I got tunnel vision. My eye and my ear are singularly on him. And if you're listening to the wrong people, they're going to rile you up. They're going to take some truths. Some of them are true. Some of them are lie. And they're going to get you all pumped up. And it's making you think that your destiny lies in a man. And that is not the truth. I don't know why we think God is so small that our destiny depends on an election in the United States. There's a whole world that he is responsible for. What we're not going to do in here is allow division to come amongst us, whatever the outcome is. But what we are going to do is we're going to be peacemakers. Oh, I know it's tight, but it's right. You got peace? No matter what happens, no matter that the numbers go up, no matter what is happening, you can't lose your peace. You do know we win in the end, right? It's in the book. And I'm not saying you can't have your opinion. Do y'all know I got lots of opinions? A whole lot of opinions. I do not tell of my opinions at the sake of losing a soul. I don't share my opinions because they are not gospel. <laughs> and if what I say is going to call a wall between me and you, the price of having peace is I don't say it. I tell you all the time, I'm neither left or right. I'm on the Lord's side. And 
whatever he tells me to do, that's what I do. And the fact that it is kept anonymous, it means it ain't none of your business. It's not any of your business. Why? Because the moment I say one way or the other, I build a wall against the other. And my job is to preach the gospel. My job is to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And if I got to hold my tongue and what I think and my opinion for the sake of someone to hear and can't be uh, uh, blocked off by what I vote or my opinion or what I think, it is well worth it. I'm asking you today, can you do the same? Because if it's enough of us, guess what? All that unrest that they're talking about is coming. We have the power to speak peace. Now, they may not change, but at least I can speak peace. Shalom. Oh, Pastor, you don't understand. Oh, I do understand. The world is as divided as it's ever been. People are hating people because of the color of their skin, because of which party they vote for, because of whether you believe the coronavirus is real or not, whether to wear a mask or not wear a mask. I mean, we have so many levels of division. But God has called us to raise up the peacemakers. I am not participating you can believe what you want to believe that's fine but I speak shalom a soft answer turns away wrath and if you are supposed to be the peacemaker and you right in the midst kicking up contention you're not from this kingdom because representatives of this kingdom know how to speak peace over wrath. It doesn't mean I have to agree with you. Now, hear me. I don't have to agree, but it's more important for us to have peace than it is for me to be right. And we love being right. So right now, wherever you are, if you're at home or whatever, if, you are, if you're going to take a stand this morning and be who God has called you to be and seek peace and pursue it, I want you to stand to your feet right where you are. We're going to make a declaration to the enemy today. Not on my watch. Now, I can't say what's happening in other parts of the country and all that stuff, but around here, if you saw when you came in, you saw the Knights Committed to Unity sign. I sit on the NDEIC, which is the Diversity Council for Nordonia Hills, and we have planned a whole Unity Week this past week to remind our children that we are one in Nordonia. No matter what tries to pull us left or right, we are one. So when you see that Unity sign, it's just that we're committed to being peacemakers. And if we could get the school district committed, if we could get the church committed, and we'll have the majority of the community. So as peacemakers, Lord God, we lift our hearts to you today. First of all, we repent for losing our peace. We repent for the conversations and the actions that we've been in, we partake in, we've partaken in. And God, now we want to be focused on your kingdom and be kingdom citizens. Therefore, we are going to seek peace and pursue it. Help us to close our mouths when we want to say Help us give soft answers that will turn away wrath. And not only in the world, God, but in our own house. Somebody like Joshua needs to be the peacemaker. Somebody needs to be able to say, you know what? It's not worth it. We're going to live in peace. God, continue to remind us throughout the week, even on election day, we lift up the nation before you. That no matter which way and what happens, that we will all unite and be Americans. We thank you, God, that you still have this under control. And whatever is to come is to come. But we know because you're God and we're part of your kingdom that all things are going to work together. We honor you. We thank you. Remind us to be the peace, the shalom that the world needs. Not only on this week, 
but forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on and give the Lord a shout. You may be seated.